Okay, let us start our next lecture. And uh, fortunately, this is the last lecture of the day, and then there will be just practical session. I guess you're already tired of me. Uh, so uh, this is the last introductory lecture, which is uh, about uh, latent variable models and uh, yeah, algorithm is some general framework uh, which allows us to uh, deal with the latent variables. A moment. Yep. So we'll, we'll start with uh, uh, considering mixtures of distributions and uh, how to, to uh, restore the probability density functions in this case. Uh, then we'll, we'll review EM algorithm and its uh, maximally general formulation. And I think that's very important because uh, in many university courses, EM algorithm is covered only um, as, uh, well, not in general form, but in some uh, particular formulations uh, that are less general than uh, it is sometimes needed uh, when, we, we, when we speak about developing our own latent variable models. Uh, we'll discuss the uh, differences between uh, discrete and continuous uh, latent variable models. And finally, if we have time, I will briefly introduce uh, uh, one of the projects which was undertaken in our group uh, called Adagram, which was uh, an extension of well-known work to vec model. Uh, and uh, from my point of view, this is a very nice and elegant example of how the establishment of latent variables in, in the standard conventional model leads to uh, the, the, the obtaining of new interesting properties of existing model. Okay, so let us start from a some motivating example. Consider the following problem. We are given a set of uh, samples which are generated from uh, one-dimensional Gaussian distribution with unknown parameters. So the task is to, to uh, estimate the, the, the parameters of this Gaussian, or in other words, to uh, restore the density function. And of course, we know that uh, the problem is, can be solved pretty easily. So this is just uh, close from uh, maximum likelihood equations for mu and for sigma. And hence, uh, we are able to uh, restore the uh, one-dimensional Gaussian distribution. Now let's complicate a bit the problem. Now we have uh, three groups of objects, and each group of objects uh, was generated from its own Gaussian distribution. And again, the, the uh, problem is to, to estimate the parameters of those Gaussians. And actually, we understand that the problem is, uh, uh, is not more difficult, and uh, it can be uh, reduced to the previous one. So we simply t uh, take uh, the, the, the red points and estimate the parameters of the red Gaussian, then we take the, the green points and estimate the parameters of the green Gaussian, and uh, so on. And uh, now the third formulation, almost the same. We still have objects which were generated from one of the three Gaussians, but the only problem is that we do not know which object was generated from uh, which Gaussian. So obviously uh, we cannot reduce this problem to the previous one, and uh, what can we do? Well, the most straightforward answer, we can still try to uh, fit one, a single one-dimensional Gaussian into this data and to obtain something like this, using closed form maximum likelihood uh, equations. And we all understand that uh, this is probably not the best choice uh, because uh, we see that, for example, here there are no objects and uh, from our, our intuition says that uh, probably here there should be uh, probab uh, probability density function should have uh, small values, but uh, if we fit single Gaussian, well, we have a quite large probability, probability mass here and here. So this means that probably we can do much better. But uh, we do, uh, and we could do much better if we uh, associated a single Gaussian for uh, subgroups of objects. The problem is that we do not know the, the, the color of the stars, or in other words, we don't know what Gaussian generated uh, which object. And uh, the standard way to, to, to solve this problem is to establish so-called latent variable model. So uh, by doing so, we, we state that uh, our data consists not only on those stars, but also on, the, uh, on, its, on its color. So there's also latent variables uh, that show from what Gaussian each object arrived. No, no such information is available in our training data. That's why those variables are called latent variables. So you may, you may think of them that uh, they exist only in your imagination. However, if you establish these latent variables, uh, your model becomes uh, much simpler. And this is the way. So uh, now let us try to formalize the intuition uh, which I described above. So let us have our objects xi. So these are the points in one-dimensional uh, one space. Uh, these are those stars. And with, the, with each object, we also associate latent variable zi. 
which shows the index of a particular Gaussian from which this object uh, uh, was generated. So the i is a discrete variable, and uh, it may take how many? Up to large k values. And now uh, let us write down the, the whole probabilistic model. So up to now, let's forget that we are Bayesians. For simplicity, let us uh, uh, try to, to perform maximum accurate estimation. So we do not uh, establish any prior distribution over theta. Of course, we can do that as well, but uh, during this talk, uh, we'll try to perform maximum accurate estimation. And then our probabilistic model is simply joint over x and z. So first of all, the data is assumed to be IID, independent identically distributed. So uh, the product, uh, the, the uh, joint distribution over the set of objects can be factorized as a product uh, of individual objects. So this is a product of uh, P of X I Z I, a given theta. And now we use product rule and perform further decomposition and uh, split this joint distribution as a P of X I given Z I theta times P of Z I given theta. Why that's important? Because now uh, let's consider the first multiplier. How Xi is distributed if we know that it came from uh, the i's Gaussian. Now it's pretty clear that this is simply the i's Gaussian with its mu and sigma squared. So this is the distribution of Xi. Each Xi is, is, uh, has Gaussian distribution, but only if we know the, the particular index of the Gaussian from which it arrived. Only then it, uh, the distrib this distribution becomes Gaussian, only if it's conditioned by the i. And we also need to establish prior distribution over the i, so this is the probability with which we can uh, take each of the Gaussians. And we encode it as some discrete distribution with the parameters pi. So the whole set of parameters, all mu's, all sigma's for all Gaussians, and all pi's uh, form our set of parameters which we denoted as theta. And now we'd like to perform a maximum likelihood estimation. So we'd like to find theta ML as a uh, point estimate for the values of parameters which maximize uh, the likelihood. And up to now, uh, if, we, if we consider this problem, so uh, of course we, we can take the log and switch to, to, to this maximization problem. This, that's a bit easier to solve. How do you think whether we can solve this problem in closed form or not? Any ideas? So we would like to maximize the likelihood of both x and z. So it means that uh, in our training set, we know both x and both z's. And we would like to estimate thetas, to estimate the parameters of each Gaussian and the prior weight of uh, each Gaussian. In such formulation, this problem is exactly equivalent to this one. Agree? x are the coordinates of the stars, and z's are the cars of the stars. So if we know uh, both x and z, then we simply take uh, the all objects which uh, came from the first Gaussian and we feed the first Gaussian there. We take all objects from the second Gaussian and feed the parameters of the second Gaussian. We do the same for the third Gaussian, and then we simply take the frequency uh, of the first, second, and third Gaussians respectively and estimate the parameters pi, uh, which are the, the uh, prior probability of uh, each Gaussian. So uh, in this formulation, the problem is pretty simple, and it has calls from solution. But this was our second example, this one. And now the question is how to, 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 to solve this problem, where only x is observed and z is, uh, is, is, is not known at the training stage. And then uh, we need to, to, to be able to maximize this function known as incomplete likelihood. And it's usually called incomplete to stress that uh, not everything is observed, that in our training data there are related variables. If we knew them, it would be complete likelihood, and the solution could be, done, uh, could be obtained in closed form. Uh, now there are related variables, so this is incomplete likelihood. And we take its log, and we use pretty much the same decomposition as we did in the last lecture, when we derived uh, variational inference. So we may uh, treat it as a log of marginal distribution. And then we can take uh, arbitrary distribution over the related variables, uh, which I denote here QZ. And I can split uh, the log of marginal distribution into two parts. The second part is simply KL divergence between our variational distribution QZ and the true posterior distribution on Z. And this is our variational R bound. So do you recognize it? So we, we had pretty much similar equation, only 
we did not uh, put theta here. So this was the only difference. But the decomposition is, is, is the same. So we know that the second part is always non-negative, uh, so the, the, the first part is variation of our bound. Why we call it variational? Because uh, it is always our bound for arbitrary choice of uh, Q of Z. And uh, uh, the idea of M algorithm, which we'll study uh, now, is that instead of optimizing these uh, log of incomplete likelihood, yep, yeah, log of incomplete likelihood, uh, we try to optimize variation of our bound with respect to theta and with respect to Qs. And we perform block coordinate optimization. So we fix theta and we update Q, then we fix Q and update theta. And uh, this is two-stage iterative algorithm known as EM algorithm. Before we proceed, let us, let us briefly uh, establish what is, what is uh, variation of our bound in general, because this is quite useful concept in applied mathematics and in many applications, not only in machine learning, uh, it, it, it arises. Assume that we have a function f of x, and we call function g of xi x variation of our bound if the following two to properties hold. First of all, for any choice of, the, of xi uh, and for all x, f of x is always greater or equal than g of xi x. So this is our bound. And we, we can uh, vary xi and we'll still have our bound on f of x. And the second property is also quite important. Uh, for any choice of x naught, there always exists such value of xi, which I denoted here as xi of x naught, that the R bound become becomes tight. So if we, if we compute g of xi x naught x naught, it will be exactly f of x naught, f of, uh, of x naught. So this means that uh, for arbitrary choice of xi, we have R bound, and for each x there exists such value of xi, then this R bound becomes tight, and inequality becomes equality. And a very simple example with, with, with which we're all familiar uh, when we tell about variation of R bounds is a tangent plane for convex function. Do you agree? If we have some con uh, um, convex function, uh, we can uh, build tangent plane at a particular point, and then it will, be, it will always be lower bound, and uh, at the point where, where it touches the convex function, uh, the lower bound becomes tight. Uh, so for this variation of our bounds, uh, parameters xi are sometimes called variational parameters. In order to stress that uh, we can vary them, but we always, but we always have our bounds. So this is uh, variation of our bound. And then, if we, if we manage to establish such kind of variation of our bound, and if we now uh, would like to optimize, to maximize f of x, then instead of directly maximizing f of x, we may consider two-stage iterative procedure. We may maximize its variation of our bound. So we fix the variation of parameters xi, and we optimize g with respect to x. Then we substitute the corresponding x and optimize the g with respect to xi. And we continue this uh, iterative process until convergence. So this is two-stage uh, iterative process, and the EM algorithm is a, is a particular case of this kind of stuff. And uh, in many cases, it appears that uh, although function f of x itself is very complicated and it's very hard to optimize, uh, in many cases we managed to, to build a family of variation of our bounds, uh, such that uh, both of these problems can be done very efficiently. And then it's preferable uh, to use this two-stage iterative process instead of direct optimization uh, of f of x. So this happens in many applications, I repeat, and uh, one of those applications is latent variable model and EM algorithm. So what do we do? Instead of directly optimizing uh, log of incomplete likelihood, log of p of x given theta, uh, we switch to this uh, variation of our bound. We need to optimize it both with respect to Q and theta. Simultaneous optimization with respect to both uh, groups of parameters is, is intractable, but uh, if we consider this two-stage iterative process, it appears that uh, if we fix theta, in many cases we may solve this problem. We may find the maximum of Q for, for the given value of theta, theta naught in a closed form. Uh, and the same uh, holds for, for the, for the uh, maximum of theta when Q is fixed. And now let, let, let's consider uh, these optimization problems in detail. So first of all, if we fix theta, so we obtain this uh, function just as a function of Q. 
and we try to, to find maximum of this expression with respect to Q. But remember that due to this decomposition, uh, this sum doesn't depend on Q, because this sum is uh, equal to log of P of X of given theta. Then maximization with respect to Q of the first term is equivalent to minimization with respect to Q of the second term, right? And the second term simply KL divergence between our Q distribution and the true posterior distribution. And this means that at each step, when we try to, to find maximum of variation of our bound with respect to Q, we simply should equate it to the true posterior distribution of, over our related variables. Now we're assuming that uh, this problem can be done in a closed form. For example, we, we deal with a, uh, conjugate families of distribution. So uh, assume that we can compute it uh, in exact way. So this is exactly, exactly the, the answer we obtain at E step. Okay, now let's consider M step. At M step, we fix Q, and we would like to optimize this expression with respect to theta. If we split this walk into two, we'll easily notice that the second term Q of Z minus log of Q of Z doesn't depend on theta, right? Because uh, denominator doesn't depend on theta, so only numerator depends on theta. And this means that when we simply optimize uh, this expression, so the expectation with respect to Q of log of joint uh, distribution over X and Z. And this is exactly what we have here. And uh, pay attention that here, uh, what do we optimize? We optimize a log of complete likelihood. So log likelihood where both X and Zs are assumed to be known. And then we average it with respect to Z. Why do we average? Because actually we do not know Z. We only have some, some distribution over Zs. So uh, because of that, we, we, take the, the expect, we compute the expectation of log of joint likelihood and we optimize it. And in many cases, uh, log of joint likelihood is a, a concave function. This is the case of so-called exponential family of distributions. And if this function is concave, so it's pretty easy to optimize, and we take the, uh, the expectation, we compute the expectation. The expectation is convex combination. Convex combination of concave function is still concave function. And this means that in many cases, even if this problem can't be solved in closed form, uh, this is a convex optimization problem. So this is maximization of concave function. So this is very easy problem for numerical optimization. So we may simply start uh, your favorite uh, optimization algorithm and you, you'll easily converge to global optimum uh, of this value. So this means that uh, M step can be done, in, in many cases can be done in a very efficient manner. And E step is also uh, doable in the case when uh, we have full conjugacy, in the case when we, when we are able to perform full Bayesian inference with respect to latent variables. What is also nice, since we, we are maximizing our variation of our bound uh, with respect to Q and uh, theta respectively at each iteration, this means that uh, our variation of our bound monot monotonically increases, and this provides us the guarantees that this process always converge. From arbitrary initial approximation, we always converge to some uh, local maximum of the incomplete log likelihood. And now let us see how, uh, the, again, the geometric intuition of how it works in order to, to, to make it more clear. So assume that this is uh, our log of incomplete likelihood. And this is the space of thetas. So how EM algorithm works? First, we fix some initial approximation uh, theta zero. And uh, now we build a uh, variation of our bound that is tied at, at the point theta zero. This means that at the point theta zero, uh, our bound uh, has the same value as uh, our log of incomplete likelihood. So this is it. We can do this by, by uh, updating Q distribution. So we find Q1 in such a way that at this particular point, for this particular theta zero, the KL divergence between Q1 and the true posterior distribution of the latent variables is zero. And that's why uh, there's no gap here. Uh, what is good is that uh, this function is concave with respect to theta. So it's concave when we easily find its maximum. So, and uh, we update the value of theta. So now it's theta one. At theta one, there's a gap between our variational bound and between the uh, log of incomplete likelihood. So we need to, to update our variational bound by updating Q. And we change Q from Q1 to Q2 in such a way that uh, for Q2, for this point theta one, the lower bound becomes tight. So this is it. 
So this is a e step. We update Q. Uh, now we get uh, raw bound, uh, new R bound, which is still concave. And we need to optimize it with respect to theta. And this is what we've done on app step. And update our well with theta uh, by uh, computing theta 2, and so on until convergence. And we see that we're closer and closer to uh, the maximum of log of incomplete likelihood. Of course, in general case, uh, this iterative procedure is only guaranteed to converge to local maximum. So in general case, we cannot guarantee that we'll converge to global maximum. And uh, if we are interested in necessarily finding the global maximum, well, the standard way out is just to run this procedure several times from different initial approximations. Then sooner or later, we'll end up uh, at the point of uh, global maximum. So this is the intuition of how it works. Instead of direct optimization of the red function, we make use of the fact that we have access and we may easily construct variation of our bounds. So for each point, for, for, for each theta, we may easily construct variation of our bound that is tied in this point theta. Uh, and then we can optimize it and update theta and construct uh, new our bound and so on until convergence. So this is it. Uh, what's interesting in the M algorithm? First of all, this is a very powerful concept. Uh, and we, and uh, it, it, it allows for, for multiple extensions, which we'll uh, further review. Uh, in many cases, in many interesting uh, applied cases, both E steps and M steps can be done in a closed form. And uh, one of the examples is the well-known mixture of Gaussians. So actually, rephrasing my supervisor, I may say that 90% uh, of the data scientists just do not know about EM algorithm. And 90% of, of those who know what is EM algorithm think that EM algorithm is, is an algorithm for the mixture of Gaussians. This is not true. EM algorithm is much more general. But the mixture of Gaussians is just the most known example of uh, its successful application. And you will review the mixture of Gaussians during the practical session. And uh, you will see that really E step and M step can be done in a closed form. And so the EM algorithm for the mixture of Gaussians is extremely efficient. So we can really separate the mixtures of Gaussians uh, even in high dimensional spaces. Uh, but this is not the, the only advantage of EM algorithm since it's, it's, it has a much wider area of, of applications. What is also nice is that uh, uh, it allows to build complicated probabilistic models for our data using mixtures of distributions. So just like we did in, in this motivating example. Uh, we had points generated from multimodal distribution. We don't know how to fit multimodal distributions in general in our data, but we know how to fit uh, unimodal distributions such as Gaussian. And by establishing additional latent variables, we managed to convert our complicated problem of fitting multimodal distributions in our data to the iterative process of fitting uh, unimodal distributions in our data by, by doing AM algorithm. Uh, so this is very nice. And... Uh, in many cases, uh, it appears that even if the, if the model of observed data is too complicated, by establishing additional latent variable, we simplify the model. The, the model. So we may establish enough, uh, enough latent variables until our joint distribution of observed and latent variables becomes very simple. For example, uh, becomes from, from exponential family of distributions, which is known to be simple, and where the maximum likelihood estimation can be done in a very efficient manner. Uh, what is also interesting? I assume that, yeah, that we have a such situation. So in classical formulation of machine learning problems, we always assume that uh, in our training data, the variables are strictly divided uh, in observed variables and in hidden variables. And we also know that at the training stage, hidden variables are known. But what, what is if, if the situation is uh, a bit more complicated? What if for each object we have arbitrary subset of, object, of uh, variables uh, which we, we observe and arbitrary subset of variables which we do not know? So then the relation between observed and hidden variables uh, looks something like this. So for, for, for different objects, we have different subsets of uh, observed and different subsets of unobserved variables. How can we proceed in this case? What model should we, should we construct if we would like to, to uh, fit probabilistic model uh, within our training data? So this problem is known as a missing data problem. And uh, in many practical applications, again, uh, this is the case. For example, in, uh, this is... Uh, especially true for the medical applications. And EM algorithm allows us to correctly uh, process the missing data. So all, all, all data which is, which is missing in our training data, uh, we simply uh, 
We simply say that these are related variables. We do not know all of them, but uh, they, they exist in our probabilistic model. And we may fit our probabilistic model, we may fit, uh, and we may, uh, we may perform maximum likelihood estimation, even if some data is, is not known, by doing M algorithm. So for, for, for the variables that we do not observe, we simply declare them latent variables, and at each step, we, st we estimate the distributions over these variables, and then using those distributions, we average the log of complete likelihood, we update theta, then we re-estimate the distributions over the uh, variables that we do not observe, update theta, and again and again until convergence. So this is another uh, advantage of uh, EM framework. It allows us to deal with the uh, uh, missing data in uh, our training set. And finally, uh, the main reason why I decided to derive your EM algorithm in the most general form uh, is following. Up to now, we, we assume that uh, we can do a step in a closed form. So this means that uh, we can compute uh, these two posterior distribution uh, and its normalization constant. But what if the situation is more difficult? What if we can't compute it? So this two uh, posterior distribution is not tractable. So we don't have access to it. What should we do? And it appears that, well, if we know the, uh, how this M algorithm was derived, if we know that actually uh, our update for Q distribution was the maximization of this variation or bound, uh, if the true posterior distribution is intractable, we may restrict the family of distributions with respect to which we try to optimize our variation or bound and come up with a so-called variational M algorithm. So on each step, instead of performing uh, full Bayesian inference, we can uh, perform variational inference. Of course, uh, then uh, we will still be able to, to update and to improve this variation or bound. Of course, now there'll be, we cannot be sure that there'll be zero gap here because we, 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 we can't update Q to be equal to the true posterior distribution. There still be some gap. But nevertheless, this, uh, this procedure is, is doable, is efficient, and uh, in many cases, it works. But to understand that, we should understand that uh, from, uh, from what consideration this equation arises. So this is not heuristic. Uh, this, is, this is simply maximization of variation or bound, or equivalently minimization of KL divergence between our Q distribution and the two posterior. And this understanding allows us to modify AM algorithms for the, for the cases when the true posterior distribution is intractable. Because we can still minimize KL divergence in, some, divergence in some restricted families of uh, distributions. For example, by doing mean field, like we did in the last lecture, or uh, by doing parametric variational inference, which we'll do tomorrow. Okay. Uh, now let's consider what happens if we, if we, if we use uh, discrete and the continuous latent variables. So consider the case when our, uh, our latent variables are discrete. Then we can uh, marginalize with respect to them and obtain P of X i given theta in complete likelihood by, by simply marginalizing uh, with respect to latent variables. And since latent variables are discrete, the marginalization is simply summation of K items. So uh, actually not too difficult. And uh, if, if, if only K is not exponentially large, then each step uh, for discrete weighted variables can be done in a closed form. Because since ZI are discrete variables, we can always compute this posterior distribution over Z given XI and given the current values of theta. So simply using Bayes' theorem, and in the denominator, there's just finite sum. The only exception when we can't do that is uh, the situation when K is exponentially large. Sometimes uh, there, are, uh, there, there are some rare cases where this is the case, but uh, hopefully not in our models. And as for the M, e, uh, as for the M step, uh, we need to, to compute expectation here. And again, since Z, uh, these are discrete variables, uh, we can do it uh, in a closed form as uh, simply the, the finite sum of uh, all likelihoods of individual objects. So both quantities can be computed in a closed form, uh, and in many cases, here we can also compute the, the maximum with respect to theta in a closed form as well, just like in the case of a mixture of Gaussians. So this is nice. Now uh, let's turn to a more, uh, more complicated situation when the latent variable is uh, continuous. So then in order to get the incomplete likelihood, so the likelihood of what we observe, P of xi given theta, we need again to marginalize with respect to 
uh, our license variable. And in this case, it becomes the, the such integral. Uh, and if we are lucky enough and these two distributions are conjugate, then we can, can do it in a closed form, but in, the, in most general cases, uh, this is not so, and uh, we can't compute this integral uh, in a closed form. So what, what uh, shall we do? We will we'll discuss tomorrow, because tomorrow we'll start uh, from, from considering latent variable models with a continuous latent variable. And as for the, uh, as for the E step, again, we need to, to estimate the posterior distribution of latent variables. And since the latent variable is continuous, uh, if we apply Bayes' theorem, uh, we immediately uh, have the integral in the denominator. Uh, and in, in the general case, it's not tractable. So again, uh, we can't uh, perform a full Bayesian inference at E step, and we, we have to, to perform some kind of uh, approximations. Fortunately, it appears that uh, these approximations in many cases can be done uh, in an efficient manner, and uh, this procedure is known as a stochastic variational inference, which we'll study tomorrow. So, uh, okay, what is the geometric sense of uh, the geometric intuition of establishing uh, discrete weighted variables and continuous weighted variables? So for the discrete weighted variables, this is simply finite mixture of distributions, something like this. So we have several distributions and we mix them and we obtain this uh, black distribution. So we try to fix, uh, to fit the black distribution into our data. So this is the idea of establishing uh, discrete latent variables. This is simply finite mixture of distributions. And as for continuous latent variables, uh, the, the, probably the closest analogy is so-called representational learning. When we try to convert our data X, which, lives in, which may live in a high dimensional complicated space, into the space uh, which has much less dimensions and where the distribution may have a much simple structure. And this is called a latent representation. So we convert very complicated objects from high dimensional space to uh, the space of uh, less dimension where the, the, the distribution of, object, of objects is uh, uh, more simple. And uh, well, the, 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 the most known example is uh, principal component analysis or independent component analysis. I guess at least some Somebody should be familiar with that, right? So this is the simplest example of using linear model for representational learning. That's not very interesting, and uh, the most interesting is when, when you use non-linear model for representational learning, but this is again what we'll study tomorrow. Uh, so, yep, this I already told. So what are the bottlenecks of EM algorithm? Uh, although in, 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 in most of cases it's, it's very efficient, but there are some difficult cases where, um, well, it either inapplicable or it should be modified. So one of them is uh, when we have, a, uh, for example, with, with each object we associate multi-dimensional discrete variable. Consider, for, for example, the case when with each object we associate a 10-dimensional binary variable. Then uh, the number of, of possible values of this discrete variable is exponentially large. So it's two to the power of 10. So it will be uh, about 1,000 of, of uh, terms in, in summation. This is still doable. But if, for example, we'll have a uh, 20 binary variables for each object, then summation becomes impractical. And we have to, to use some kind of approximations. Uh, another, another difficult case is when the object has both uh, discrete and continuous weighted variables. Then again, it's, it's not clear how to deal with them because at this, at this step, we, we have to estimate the, the posterior distribution, posterior joint distribution over both discrete and uh, continuous weighted variables. We will consider one example tomorrow of the situation where uh, this can be. So uh, we, we have to involve the mixed discrete continuous distribution of latent variables. Sometimes this is possible, but in most cases, uh, such distributions are not tractable. And finally, uh, the case when we have continuous latent variables for non-conjugate uh, pairs of distributions. Then again, at each step, we cannot uh, perform uh, full Bayesian inference, and for all these cases, uh, the simple solution, we should use variational Bayesian inference, which we studied uh, on the last lecture. And uh, again, we'll see several examples uh, tomorrow and today during practical session. Uh, and uh, I will now switch to the brief description of uh, one, one example of latent variable model, which I like a lot because, well, I was one of the inventors of this model. And uh, you'll, give, uh, you'll be given a special talk, a special invited talk by Sergei Bartonov, who was well, the, the main author of this model and who works 
now a DeepMind, and at that time uh, he was my PhD student. Uh, so the model is a latent variable extension of known Vortovec model. So raise the hands, those of you who heard about uh, Vortovec. Good, almost everyone. So the model itself is uh, pretty simple. Uh, it was uh, developed by Tomasz Mikulov, who was at that time PhD student in, <coughs> in some Czech university, and now he's leading research in Facebook AI research. So he, he um, considered pretty standard uh, problem of language modeling. Uh, the prediction of what in the text according to its context. So we have text, uh, we have uh, one specific word, and we're trying to predict its neighbors. So this is pretty standard uh, problem in computational linguistics. And uh, Mikulov developed a very efficient model, it was a probabilistic model, uh, for, uh, that was able to, to, to predict neighboring words. So let's use uh, following notation. Uh, let's, let us not, uh, denote x current word, and why its neighbors. And we would like to, to, to predict uh, all neighbors of the current word and uh, to do this for, for all words in our uh, text set. And we also have parameters theta, uh, which parameterize our model. What Mikulov did, uh, he developed such kind of model that involved, that converted all, all words in our vocabulary to vector representations. To, to the vector in the Euclidean uh, 255 dimensional space. So this vector representation I will denote as v of x. And so the, the prediction algorithm takes the vector representation of each word and computes the likelihood function, computes the probability of uh, predicting the corresponding word, uh, word y. I will not go into details of, of the model itself, it's not important for now. What's important is that uh, Mikulov's model or Wartovec model or Skipgram model use vector representations of the words uh, in our vocabulary. And then if I given uh, the set of texts, uh, or the one text, or several texts, uh, we simply perform maximum likelihood estimation, and we optimize with respect to the model parameters theta, and with respect to vector representations of the words which are used for prediction. And Mikov uh, developed a super efficient algorithms which were able to process the whole Wikipedia, the whole English Wikipedia, uh, for just 20 minutes. So this was really breakthrough. Uh, no existing algorithm at the time was able to um, process such uh, amount of information for so limited time. And surprisingly it appeared, and probably the, the most of you are familiar with it, uh, some surprising properties. It appeared that uh, algebraic operations or vector representations correspond to semantic operations over the meanings of the words. Uh, this was uh, quite surprising, and uh, I asked once Tomasz whether he expected this effect or not, he thought no. That was a surprise for him as well. Nevertheless, uh, if we take, for example, the vector representation of the word Paris, we subtract the vector representation for the word France, we add Russia, and we, we, we obtain a point in the Euclidean space, which is very close to vector representation for the word of Moscow. And there are thousands, thousands of examples uh, of such kind of uh, effects. So it appeared that uh, the vector representations, which we obtain in this word to vector mod uh, model, uh, capture the notions of gender, of number, of uh, some geographical notions, and of many other uh, semantic properties. So this is nice, and this, in some sense, uh, shows that probably computer understands much better uh, from the text that, that was uh, previously thought. And here comes the problem. We know that uh, there are many words in our vocabulary that may have different meanings, depending on the context. For example, the word Waterloo. We know that Waterloo is a famous battle during the Napoleonic Wars. We know that Waterloo is also the name of a railway station in London. And we know that Waterloo is a famous hit by ABBA. Uh, so if we run Wartovec model, and if we build vector representation for the word Waterloo, it's not clear whether uh, this vector representation will be close to vector representations for the words which correspond to stations in London or to vector representations, uh, to vector representations of the words uh, which are somehow related with uh, Napoleonic wars, or it should be close to vector representations for the words which are related to ABBA and uh, to, to its hits. Uh, so what, what would be highly desirable? Can we, can we extend the model in such a way that we would be able to assign vector representation not to the word itself, but to its meaning? So up to now, the model works like this. 
we take the word and uh, we can construct vector representation for the word. Can we ex extend the model? Can we assign vector representation not to a word itself, but to its meaning, to one of its meanings? And for example, we assume that word has three meanings. The first meaning corresponds to station, the second corresponds to battle, and the third corresponds to the song. Then we should have three different vector representations. Vector representation word 1, word 2, and word 3. Uh, well, formally speaking, yeah, formally speaking, uh, this is possible. So we can easily extend the model, and uh, uh, we can substitute, instead of vector representations for the words, here we, we, we can substitute vector representations for the words and its meanings. And we can try to maximize the likelihood just like we did in, uh, in the uh, word to vec model. The only problem is that during training stage, we do not have access to the particular meanings of a particular word occurrences. Do you agree? So we observe x axis, but we do not observe uh, the, the indexes of its particular meanings. So we meet the word what all, but we don't know whether it corresponded to the first meaning or to the second or to the third one. And the way out is to use Latin variables. So let's assume that uh, we can have this information. Let's assume that our vector representations correspond not just to the word, but to the word plus its meaning. We do not observe meanings at the training stage because we observe only text. Uh, so this would be latent variables. And then we, uh, we easily extend the model just like this. So uh, we can easily write down the probability of our prediction of y given x, given its particular meaning, and given the parameters of the, uh, of the model itself. And the likelihood function can be computed as follows. So it takes vector representation not of not of just the word, but of the word and its meaning. And it also takes y and theta. So we can uh, train it as before, using maximum likelihood estimation. But the problem is that uh, z is not known for us. So what can we do? We establish a proper prior distribution. For example, uniform distribution uh, among different word meanings, or some more meaningful distribution using the results from uh, linguistics theory. Uh, linguists know how, to, how, to, how different meanings uh, are distributed uh, for the words. And now uh, we have uh, this kind of model, P of Y, Z given X theta, and we can solve the problem of incomplete likelihood optimization. Uh, incomplete because we do not observe Z here, and this is already pretty standard formulation for EM algorithm. So we, we have converted uh, our problem to the problem where which we know how to solve. We simply should use EM algorithm. Uh, at each step, we should estimate the probability of each meaning of a given word, of a given context, with a given, with the current values of parameters. And uh, it can be done pretty easily because here, uh, discrete variable, uh, here, latent variable is discrete. And uh, for example, when we see such sentence, our, our train arrived to Waterloo at 2 p.m., uh, at each step, we should obtain something like this. So we should estimate the probability of each sense, station, battle, and so on. And uh, uh, according to the context, context is given by y, uh, we probably should, should end up with something like this, that station is more probable than battle, which is more probable than, than song. And this is, uh, uh, we, we expect to see something like this at, at the intermediate iteration of our EM algorithm. Of course, when the algorithm converged, uh, we hope to see much contrast picture, and uh, this is exactly what we, what we see, what I will show uh, just in a few slides. So this is how each step works, and this is how M step should work. So after we have computed the distribution of all related variables, we simply take the uh, joint, the, the, the complete likelihood, the joint distribution of y and z. We take the log and we average it out with respect to the distribution over z. And we maximize it with respect to theta and v. And this, this problem is uh, almost equivalent to standard word to vec optimization model. Uh, the, the, the only difference is that uh, the, the number of vector representations uh, is increased several times because uh, we don't have single vector representation for the word, but several vector representations for different word meanings. So this is, this is a general scheme how it could be work, uh, how it could be done. Uh, and the question to you, how do you think whether this is computationally efficient scheme or not? Uh, the number of meanings. Yep, uh, this is still open question. Up to now, assume that we somehow know the number of meanings for each word. Just for simplicity. I will tell you a bit later how to do that. 
But even if we know for each word how many meanings it has, this procedure, the EM algorithm in this formulation is completely inefficient. Why? I assume that uh, we're trying to process English Wikipedia, just like Thomas Mikulov did. So it's about uh, one billion of words there. And now, let us see this iterative process. So we, we, we should repeat E and Z step iteratively until convergence. And at each E step, we have to, to compute one billion of these probabilities. For each word, we have to compute the probability of each of its, of its meanings. And at M step, here we have a summation with respect to all, all the words in our uh, training set and summation with all its meanings. So this is one billion of words times, say, three or four. This is the average amount of different meanings for each word. So this is completely an efficient procedure because uh, the, the, the computational complexity of just one iteration of the M algorithm becomes huge. Uh, so we, we, we need to, to, to develop some kind of scalable version of the M algorithm. And this is, again, this is again one of the goals of the summer school is to, to, to uh, provide you with the spirit of scalability, to provide you with the uh, intuition of uh, how different methods can be scaled up. So uh, in this formulation, the EM algorithm is not scalable. And how to scale it up, uh, you, will, you will know from, well, uh, partly from tomorrow, partly from the invited talk by Sergey. So I will not go into details here. I, only, I will only mention that uh, it is possible to develop very scalable implementation of uh, EM algorithm just by modifying uh, these steps a bit. And it appears that uh, then the whole procedure uh, works approximately, well, requires approximately the same time as just standard Wotovec model. So, well, maybe several times more, but still, uh, uh, this is still practical. So, if Wotovec model required 20 minutes to pass through the whole Wikipedia, uh, the model with scalable EM, EM algorithm uh, requires about one hour, maybe an hour and a half to pass through the whole English Wikipedia. So, this is still very practical. Uh, what I didn't talk, uh, what, I, uh, what I haven't discussed here is uh, how to deal, how to define the number of different meanings for different words. And this is also quite interesting techniques based on so-called non-parametric Bayesians, uh, non-parametric uh, Bayesian inference, uh, to be more exact, on the Chinese restaurant processes. And this is uh, uh, what Sergey will talk about. Uh, up to now, just believe me that this is possible. So it's really possible to automatically define the number of different meanings for different words using some, well, advanced uh, Bayesian techniques. And currently, I will just uh, briefly show you several examples of how it works. Uh, so consider, th 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 these are, by the way, not cherry-picked examples. Uh, we, we took the example, examples just by random. So we took the word platform, and for the word platform, computer discovered three different, uh, three different meanings. And we considered the direct representation for each meaning, and we uh, examined what are the closest words in, in the Euclidean space, what are the closest vector representations in the Euclidean space. For the first meaning of the word platform, these are the closest words. And we can clearly see that uh, all of them are somehow related to automobile industry. So we understand that this platform, uh, this meaning is related to automobiles. So uh, the second meaning of the word platform is definitely related to public transportation. And we understand that this platform is a just facility used in public transportation. And finally, the, the, the last meaning, uh, its closest words are all related to software engineering. So I understand that uh, this platform has the sense of something, uh, some software platform. Maybe even more illustrative example is the word sound. We know that sound in, in the English language has two meanings. One is a water passage which, which separates island from continent, and another is a acoustic effect. And we see that uh, the, the, the first meaning, the, the closest words to the first meaning are definitely uh, related to, to sound as a water passage, while the, the Second meaning is definitely related to acoustic effects. So this is pretty nice. So this means that at least sanity check is, is, uh, uh, is, is satisfied. And now let's consider a bit uh, more complicated example. Word is immigration. So we run our model. Uh, we take the word Vato. Uh, for it, uh, uh, five meanings were found. And let us try to perform this immigration. So let's see this, this sentence. Who won the battle of Vato? Uh, and let's try to understand uh, what particular meaning uh, this word occurrence had. So if we, if we uh, compute the probability of different meanings, uh, it, it will appear that 
more than 99% of the probability mass is concentrated around the second meaning. So the, now the question is, uh, what is this second meaning? And uh, to understand this, we again uh, examine the closest uh, words to the second meaning. So here they are. And I don't know whether many of you know history, but uh, I can see at least several major battles of uh, uh, Napoleonic Wars, such as Austerlitz, Jena Auerstadt. But uh, all other wars, they're all major battles in some wars where either French or British or Prussian troops were involved. And we remember that in Battle of Waterloo, there was a battle between French on one side and British and Prussians on the other side. So all these wars are names of the battles where at least one of the either France or Britain or Prussia was involved. The only exception is, is this one, Toba Fusimi. It was a pleasant surprise for me when I, when I discovered it, but when I checked in Wikipedia, it appeared that this is a major battle in Japanese civil war where one side was supported by British Navy and another side was consulted by French officers. So in some sense, this was still a battle between France and uh, uh, Great Britain. Okay, now let's consider another context, the same word Waterloo, but the context is different. Our train has departed from Waterloo at 11 p.m. And uh, if we compute the, the probabilities of different meanings, uh, it appears that uh, about 95% of all probabilistic mass is concentrated around the first meaning. So we know that the second meaning already corresponds to some battle. And what is the first meaning? If we uh, consider top, t uh, top 10 uh, closest words to this first meaning of the word water, surprisingly it will appear that the five closest words are names of uh, main railway stations in London, Paddington, Houston, Victoria, Liverpool, and Moorgate. While other words are definitely related with uh, transportation and with London. So this is, this is uh, pretty nice. And uh, this is, from my point of view, a very elegant example of how we, we managed to incorporate latent variables in standard and conventional model. So the initial model of Wurzelberg uh, didn't have any latent variables. So this was just a standard model for language modeling. And it worked quite good, and it, it was able to construct interpretable vector representations for the words. But now we, we, we decided to, to establish additional latent variables. And by doing this, we obtained new possibilities. We extended the model, and now the model is able to perform word sense disambiguation. So we can now identify what particular meaning the particular word occurrence had, depending on the, on the context. So this is, uh, this is uh, pretty nice. And uh, this was only possible because we established latent variables in our initial probabilistic models. So uh, to, 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 to conclude. Uh, what are the nice properties of latent variable models and the uh, EM algorithm as a main tool for working with the uh, latent variable models? First of all, uh, we can uh, fill the gaps in our data, so we, we can correctly process missing data. Uh, in many cases, we can reveal the hidden structure of the data. For example, we can uh, find clusters in the case of discrete latent variables, or we can uh, learn the all dimensional manifolds, linear or nonlinear. Uh, this is a learning representation problem. Sometimes we can uh, find hidden information in the, uh, in the training data, so we can extract more information from the training data than it was contained there, just like we did in this other gram example, uh, where initially we had just uh, a set of texts, and we managed to perform word sense disambiguation, although we were not given any information about any meanings of the, of the particular word occurrences in our training data. And uh, what remains uncovered here is the uh, scalability of uh, how we can scale uh, the, the initial formulation of EM algorithm. It's not so trivial, uh, because up to now the EM algorithm is iterative, and at, at M step, it involves solving optimization problem of a uh, um, complete likelihood uh, maximization. So if the problem of complete likelihood optimization is computationally difficult, then such iterative process is not efficient. But uh, soon we'll, 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 we'll study how to make it uh, very scalable and very computationally efficient. So that's all for now. Thanks for your attention. And if there are any questions, I am ready to, to answer. Yep. That uh, you showed uh, several topics that you're not covering in this in this talk. And you mentioned that you uh, suggest to use Chinese restaurant process to define proper number of possible meanings. Right. But as far as I understand that uh, by using a Chinese restaurant process, you uh, have to distribute 
within all existing states and also have chance to explore new states. Yep. So you always have chance to access new meanings. Now how could you define proper number of meanings? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And I would, I would answer it in the following way. Uh, the larger and larger text we have in our training set, the, more, the, the better and better semantic resolution we can afford. So for example, uh, for example, yeah, yeah, I, I will give you a particular example. Uh, let's consider the word bank. So we can easily distinguish between two meanings, bank as a bank of the river and bank as a some financial institution, right? But if we have very large text, we can distinguish between different sub-meanings. Sub for example, a bank as a financial institution uh, may have some sub-meaning bank as a building. Just right after the bank, you'll turn left. Bank as a building. Bank as a place where people work. My brother works in a, a Swiss bank. Bank as a place where people uh, keep money. And bank as an element of microfinancial system of the state. They're all related to bank as financial institution. But there are several sub-meanings. And this is exactly what we observe. So uh, this example with bank was uh, uh, discovered by us in, in our Adegar model. So the larger text we have, the more different meanings we can extract, and we can distinguish between different meanings. And this is, uh, uh, this is exactly what is done in Chinese restaurant process. The more data we have, the more uh, values of hidden variables we can identify there. So we, we can say that uh, the given word has exactly three meanings. We may reveal more meanings if we have access to a larger text and uh, where we can distinguish between different sub-meanings. So this is how, how, how it works in, in this Adegar model, and this would be, um, the more details will be in Sergei's talk. Yep. So uh, you also mentioned something about uh, missing variables uh, and uh, how can we manage uh, missing data in the data set. Um, can you please talk more about it because I don't really understand how would it work uh, because uh, uh, missing variables sometimes yeah. are still present. Let us set out this way. Uh, if after tomorrow's lecture you'll still not understand how it works, I will answer you tomorrow uh, after my lecture. Because there there'll be some examples of how to, to, to fill the gaps in the probabilistic PCA model. Okay, great. Uh, I have a question about uh, dimensionality of theta. Can it affect uh, uh, count of meanings that uh, your model can uh, find. So if we have uh, a dimensionality of theta is uh, 100, then we can find uh, 10 meanings of uh, some word like bank. If we set it uh, to 500, uh, we'll find maybe more meanings or less meanings. Do you have some experiments like this? Uh. Good question. Well, first of all, uh, you probably mean not the dimensionality of theta, but dimensionality of vector representation. Yes, yes. Because theta may have different sense. So these are just the parameters yes. of our prediction algorithm. Yes. Uh, and uh, well, we 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 have experiment. Yeah, yeah. We 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 have uh, done several experiments with the different dimensions of vector space. Uh, and we, 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 we managed to find very big dependence that uh, uh, the, 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 the less is dimensionality of your vector space, the more meanings are found. But the dependence was, was very weak. Okay. So um, I think that uh, we may well roughly say that uh, the dependence is not significant. So how, come, uh, how can we make sure that the latent variable we introduced will capture uh, the missing information like meanings, not any other information that we didn't know because of lack of domain knowledge or something? Uh, well, the, the, the quickest answer, we can't. So we just try and hope for the best? Or? So uh, when you build latent variable models, uh, this, it is more art than the science. So you should have some intuition that you really expect to see some, some, some interpretable information in these weighted variables. If you just establish them uh, in a senseless way, uh, you, will, you will obtain uh, bullshit on input, bullshit on output. 
So you, you should have some, some intuition. But in many cases, uh, there exists such intuition. For example, here where, where you expect to have different vector representation for different meanings. Because you already know that vector representation contains some semantic information. If you do not know that fact, there were, there were no reasons of establishing uh, these the, the certain variables for different meanings. But we already know that in the initial vector vector model, vector representations do contain some information about the sense. Then this is very reasonable to assume that we may do even better if we establish related variables for the word meanings and we'll construct vector representations not for the words but for its meanings. Okay, uh, what if we have an intuition uh, that the item variable, that we have two types of missing information? How can we model like something like that? Something well, like we can that? establish two kinds of, of latent of variables. variables. Yep. And we hope that each one, okay. And tomorrow we'll see one example right. of Thank such you. model. Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, may I ask? Uh, uh, yeah. Alexander, nice to see you. This is the guy who refused to, be, to become my PhD student several years ago and went to States, right? Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have uh, a question regarding your example for water law. In total, you had five meanings. Yep. Are those remaining three also as interpretable? Uh, let, let, let me think. Uh, oh, at least one of them. No, 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 no. One of them is Abason. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, definitely interpret uh, has interpretable meaning. Another word was, uh, uh, I guess, wait, which one? Yeah, probably the, the fourth one is water law as a village in Belgium. Yeah, I see. It's what uh, like uh, struck my attention. Because it's this, this is why uh, four percent of probability mass was was assigned to this as as a village, because uh, this can be also our train has departed from water law Belgium at uh, <laughs> 11 p.m. And as for the last sense, I don't remember, but I, I think that its its probability was uh, negligible, so we could we could simply skip it. I see. Thank you very much. So, okay, if there are no, no more questions, uh, thanks for your attention. Now we have a 15 minutes break and then practical session and post session. And I see you tomorrow.